Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I thank you for all coming out today and those online as well. I've been well warned by ICT not to do my usual and wander about like a preacher on the platform here. Uh, so some of them will try to get away with a few dates like that. But um, it's a pleasure to be here today. It's the penultimate day, actually, of Orange Heritage Week, which uh, is the institution's way of opening up its facilities, opening up some of its activities to the wider public to encourage them to learn more about the institution, learn more about the Orange family and oranges in general. And uh, it begins with the anniversary of the Battle of the Diamond and the formation of the Orange Institution as we know it today and finishes on the 20th of September, the anniversary, of course, of the signing of the Ulster Song League Covenant, which is Northern Ireland's uh, famous, if you like, document. Uh, I'd like to thank Jason Burke, and he's always the man to blame if he invites speakers like me to come and talk to you today. But uh, for those of you who have had your lunch, this should act as a, a wonderful dose of Andrew's liver salts to help things along. <laughs> uh, for those of you who haven't eaten yet, I do apologise wholeheartedly uh, for what you're about to receive uh, over the next few minutes. Um, it's a very appropriate topic, as we said, given our heritage weekend. This afternoon, I want to take a little bit of departure. Um, and uh, just in case anybody complains that this was a little bit like clickbait, I won't be doing the internals of Orangeism. I thought it was more fascinating to look at some of the characters and their backgrounds within the institution, what they did, not necessarily what they did within uh, formal orange constraints, but who they were, what they did in terms of their profession. And they were also members of the Orange Institution. So my talk will take the form of a series of mini biographies of these individuals. And I see a few here. So before any current members of the County Grand Lodge of Red, Belfast, Rika Sweat, those who I have chosen to have long since left us. My goal today is to demonstrate the breadth of talent, profession, and energy that has characterized those involved in Belfast Orangeism in the 19th and early 20th century. It should come as no revelation to many that uh, orange men and women are involved in much more than celebrating the Glorious Revolution on the annual 12th of July parades and celebrations. They have been politicians and soldiers, merchants and missionaries, business personalities and philanthropists. Members of the Orange Institution have helped build and develop this city and left a positive legacy for future generations. So in future, whether you're visiting the Ulster Museum, attending a service in Christchurch, or even perhaps having a sneaky lemonade at the Hatfield Bar, you will be able to spare a thought for the orange personality who was involved in that particular institution, building or organization. So hope people can see behind me. Yes, no, yes. Uh, I'll be name checking a few people in the audience too, so they probably know some of the individuals a little more than I do. Uh, Peter McCabe, I see, has come in. So if anybody wants a very good uh, orange tour of the city cemetery, speak to Peter. Peter, who did a fascinating one on Orange Heritage Week a few years ago. There's some of the orange and unionist personalities um, who are buried in the city cemetery. So the Reverend Dr. Thomas Drew. Thomas Drew was born in Limerick. In 1800 and attended Trinity College Dublin, graduating in 1826. The following year, he was ordained and in 1832 moved to Belfast after a short period as curate near Bushane in County Andrew. During his time in the city, he would inject new energy into the Church of Ireland, quickly making Christ Church the largest congregation in the city by 1833, just after one year of being post, and supervising the completion of no fewer than 20 new church buildings. His low church inclination allowed him to enthuse the working class population, a uh, Protestant population, and in turn grow the size of his own congregation. At its height, an estimated 1,000 people were sitting in the pews of Christ Church on a Sunday service. His attitude towards high church clergy and their practice did, however, occasionally draw him into disagreement with the then Bishop of Down and Connor, one Richard Mount. He helped drive the evangelical spirit of working class Protestantism in mid 19th century Belfast, along with other charismatic individuals like the Reverend Hugh Hannah. 
He has, however, been accused at times of feeding sectarian feeling, with one of his fiery sermons taking place at the annual Battle of the Boyne commemoration in 1857, and being cited as a possible motivation for some of the inter-community violence that followed for 10 days that particular year. Drew was a staunch orange man in the city and also rose to the position of Grand Chaplain of the Grand Lords and Lords of Ireland. Reflecting his church activities with working class communities, he became a champion of plebeian orangeism and is believed that the role of the United Kingdom was to evangelise the world. He believed deeply in providing religious education for children across the city and much of his ministry was devoted to ensuring that young people were one to Christ. This commitment to bettering the lives of poor and needy children touched a nerve in Victorian Belfast and won many advocates within the newly emerging middle class. As a consequence, the Congregation of Christ Church became truly representative of all the classes, social classes in the city. Such was the success of his work with young people that almost 800 of them attended the annual Children's Day festivities in 1844. The banner they carried before them from Christchurch up to Botanic Park and Gardens read, Feed My Lambs. Drew believed the church had a social responsibility to look after the spiritual but also the practical needs of the city's children. He was at Christ Church until 1859, after which he was appointed the rector of Lochan Island in County Down and presenter of Down Cathedral. His desire within church life to create an integration of the classes within his congregations and those under his charge was clearly a reflection of that other cross-class, cross-denominational, Protestant alliance in his life, the Loyal Orange Institution. Our second individual today is also a Church of Ireland minister, and I know Gordon, you'll be very pleased that all the clergy I have picked today are members of the Anglican tradition, uh, for one reason or another, so I hope you'll give me brownie points on that. The Reverend Dr. Richard Rutledge Cain, or Richard Cain, was born in Oma on the 10th of June, 1841, brought up in County Cavan, where his father was minister of the Primitive Methodist Church in Belturbet. Cain joined the Church of Ireland and became curate of Dundonald before transferring to Dorset. In 1871, however, he returned to Ireland, being appointed as curate of Tully Nish Parish Church near Guildford in County Down, and became rector there the following year. Ten years later, in 1882, he was appointed as rector of Christ Church, one of the largest, as we have seen, Church of Ireland churches, which primarily served the catchment area of Sandy Road and surroundings. At the end of 1884, he was elected to the, as the post of Grand Master of the Belfast County Grand Lodge, a position he occupied until his death. He was also Vice President of the Belfast Conservative Association and the Ulster Loyalist Union, again perpetuating the legacy that uh, Drew had adopted of intertwining Protestant politics and uh, Protestant religious outlook. Cain was an enthusiast of the Gaelic League and allegedly signed some of his large minutes in Irish, declaring on several occasions, including in orange functions and from orange platforms, that my orangeism does not make me any less proud to be a Lucan. In 1895, he became one of the patrons of the Belfast branch of the Gaelic League and was one of the organizers and speakers at the 1892 Ulster Unionist Convention. It was him, apparently, who was responsible for the appearance of the motto in Irish on the side of the convention of the building, Aaron O'Brien. He died on the 20th of November, 1898, at the young age of 58. His funeral to the city cemetery was one of the largest that Belfast had and has ever seen, with an estimated 60,000 people watching the procession pass by. A number of orange lodges would be founded in his memory, including Cain and Royal 890 in Sandy Row District, Cain's Volunteers in Guildford District, and Cain's Crimson Star in Portadown. Such was the reverence in which he was held by ordinary orange men. 
a little bit of a departure now from the clerical theme to one William Johnson of Ballycombe Bay. And people have said, well, William Johnson isn't from Belfast, but uh, I will explain as we go forward. William Johnston is a folk hero and seen as a stalwart defender of the right to march in Ireland. He was born in County Down on the 22nd of February 1829, and during his lifetime he progressed quickly through the ranks of the loyal orders, eventually becoming Grand Master of the Imperial Grand Black Chapter. He had joined Bally Donald, LOL 1446, on the 8th of May 1848. A year later, a clash, a very famous clash, took place between Orange Men and their opponents at Dolly's Play outside of Freiland. To prevent further instances of violence, the government introduced the Party Processions Act of 1850, which prohibited all kinds of party displays in Ireland. This legislation was reinforced the following year by the Party Emblems Act, which was supposed to ban the display of all partisan flags and emblems. Johnston strenuously opposed both pieces of legislation, which he felt were aimed primarily at the Protestant community. During the 1860s, he organised a number of defiant protests against these acts, the most famous of them being the march of thousands of orange men from Newton Arts to Bangor in 1867. This was in defiance not only of the government, but also of the Grand Orange Lodge of Ireland. His approach generated significant support within working class orangeism, especially in Belfast. This was reflected when a special train containing hundreds of Orangemen and their supporters left the city with great pomp and ceremony for the illegal parade between Newton Arts and Bangor. As soon as the train drew out of the station, flags, bunting, and ribbons of an orange and purple persuasion proceeded to flow from its windows. His actions annoyed many within the Orange leadership and indeed incurred the wrath of the British government, who sought a prosecution against him for a breach of the legislation. The subsequent trial provided Johnson with a wonderful platform to articulate his arguments against the procession's legislation and its unfair implementation in Ireland. Found guilty, he was imprisoned for a short time, but it was enough to secure his status as a martyr within popular Orangism. This was especially the case in the city of Belfast. Such was the regard in which he was held by ordinary rank and file Belfast Orange men that they added their voices and their electoral strength to calls for him to stand for Parliament. His nomination, secretly supported by Liberal Unionist grandees against the established Conservative candidate, ensured that the newly enfranchised working class Orange vote returned him as MP in South Belfast. Johnston was now able to articulate his views at Westminster, and the government were forced to quietly remove and repeal the Party Processions Act in 1872. To borrow a quote from Gordon Lucy, it's not often that a newly elected MP succeeds in achieving their main aim in their first term of office. Although not a Belfast orange man, Johnston did more to politically educate working class orangeism in the city than many others before, during, or since his era. In some respect, he was both a charismatic individual, but one with substance. He was someone who knew what he wanted to do when in a leadership position, rather than just wanting to be in a leadership position. Our next character is from the newspaper world, the journalistic world, Sir Robert Byrd, as he became. Robert Byrd was a prominent newspaper proprietor in Belfast in the late 19th and early 20th century. He took over the Belfast Evening Telegraph at the age of 31 and brought the newspaper to new heights of success. He was also a director of around a dozen other Irish newspapers by the 1920s. The family tradition in the newspaper and print world started with William and George Byrd, who had initially joined the small Ulster Printing Company in Arthur Street, Belfast. When it went into liquidation in 1861, they raised the £450 to buy the business and quickly turned it around. At the time of the election in South Belfast for William Johnson in 1868, 
uh, which he won by a landslide, they issued an election broadsheet which rapidly sold out. This inspired and encouraged them to bring out their own newspaper, which eventually became the Belfast Telegram. So Robert himself began his career in the bird printing premises in Arthur Street, working as a compositor for at least 10 hours every day. When the first copies of the Belfast Evening Telegraph, as it was known then, were printed in 1870, he sold the first one literally hot off the press to the Reverend Henry Smith of Balmoral, who was among a group of people and dignitaries observing the birth of this new paper. And to all those Presbyterians out there, note, he sold and not gave the first edition of the paper to those watching. The Bird family was responsible not only for the Belfast Telegraph, but the Balamina Weekly Telegraph, the Lord Times, and in, the 19, in 1910, they established the Irish Post, which was an orange inclined newspaper for County Cavan's largely Protestant readership within the Unionist community. It continued until 1920, when sadly the troubles surrounding partition and the pressures on the Protestant community led to its demise. In addition to his interest in the newspaper industry, he was a prominent Freemason and member of the Orange Institution. When he died, aged 80 in 1934, he was a deputy Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Ireland and held a similar position in the Grand Orange Lodge of Scotland. He was also past master of his own lodge, 1045, and the word was changed and reissued in the year of his death and named the Sir Robert Baird Memorial Temperance Lodge, LL 122. Continuing the, the business theme and the significant business theme, we turn to William T. Braithwaite. In the course of his life, William Thomas Braithwaite achieved much. He was a businessman, philanthropist, Freemason, and orange man. Born in 1844, he was raised and spent most of his life in the city of Belfast. After leaving school, he would embark on a very successful business career. He was co-founder of Spirit Merchants, Braithwaite and Buchanan, and went on to establish a chain of very successful public houses in the city. The first pub which they opened, and still bears their name and bolded on a metal arch across the front of the building, is on the Orwell Road. I wonder how many current patrons of the Hatfield Bar now realise that was established and they walk under an, or an arch, maybe an orange arch in metal, uh, dedicated to worshipful brother William Thomas Braithwaite when the facility was finally opened in 1889. Other notable premises that were opened and expanded by the pair included the Red Lion on the Orme Road, the Garrick on Chichester Street and the Store Bar in Church Lane. This chain made the pair very successful and very wealthy, and Braithwaite was determined to apply some of his wealth into charitable projects within the city. As a member of the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society, he was a driving force behind the development of the city's museum, making and encouraging financial donations and items for collections to the municipal museum itself, which would eventually become what we now know as the Ulster Museum. Some of the pieces of artwork he donated included two pieces by the Flemish artist Peter Bruegel the Younger in 1633 called Winter and Spring. And if anyone follows such things, fine art on BBC, there was a series, I think it was 2015 or 2016, which had both of these masterpieces being restored as part of the series Britain's Lost Masterpieces. Braithwaite was also very crucial and instrumental to the foundation of the Belfast Orange Widows Fund, which has done a tremendous job of work with, uh, in terms of helping widows and orphans in the city and who are part of the Orange family in Belfast for the past century. Braithwaite was also crack shot with a rifle, nicknamed Bullseye Braithwaite. Uh, I don't know if you can make that out on screen. You'll see him and some of his compatriots who represented Ireland at rifle and air rifle competitions uh, particularly the Elko Shield, and that's the large shield in the corner there, uh, which they won in competition. Over 20 years uh, taking part in such competitions, he won the Wimbledon Cup, the Albert Jewel, and the Duke of Cambridge's trophy. Despite his success and his uh, financial gain and his position, Braithwaite never sought elected office, 
preferring instead to work in the background. This modest attitude is reflected in the nature of his headstone and grave, and if you speak to Peter, he will take it to take you to it, uh, which is in the city cemetery. Our only, uh, I think, formal soldier today that we're going to look at is again initially a county down man, but of course, as we all know, everything good comes from county down and expands as well. Uh, Colonel Robert H. Wallace. Robert Hugh Wallace, born in Downpatrick County Down, was educated at Harrow School before finishing at Oxford. He trained as a solicitor and was called to the bar in 1886, before formally being admitted to the role of solicitors in Ireland in 1890. You may be wondering why I'm talking about the County Down man again, but Wallace would become Grand Master of Belfast County Grand Lodge and hold the post for 20 years. Like many orange men of his time, Wallace also served in the military. In 1889, he was commissioned to the Royal South Dublin Militia, Royal South Down Militia, and gained promotion in 1880, 1882, and 1892. Indeed, by 1898, the outbreak of the Second World War, he had achieved the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He saw active service in the war and was mentioned in dispatches while commanding his battalion. He was appointed to the Companion of the Order of the Bath on the South African Honours List of 1902 and was presented with this by the King himself later that year. In 1913, he resigned his commission to focus on his interests within the law, but also uh, the fact that he was a keen and active member of the Ulster Unionist Party and the drive to secure the Unionist position during the height of the Third Home Rule Crisis. The drive to create and secure a new volunteer army just after the outbreak of the Great War resulted in many experienced soldiers being recalled and put back into commission. Between 1915 and 1917, he would command the 19th Reserve Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles before being appointed to the position of Commandant of the Training Camp in 1917 in Donner in Newcastle. At the end of the war, Wallace returned to focus on building his legal practice and his involvement in union unionist politics. He was appointed to CBE in 1920 and to the Privy Council at the inauguration of Northern Ireland's first parliament. Just to make sure that uh, all aspects of Orangism and the Orange family are included, we look and touch on some of the ladies who have been crucial to the development and, um, if you like, changing the debate and nature of what oranges have meant in the city uh, over this past 200 years. The Ladies' Orange Association has been through three main incarnations since its first one was issued in 1801. Although the institution twice lapsed, it was revived at the height of the third home rule crisis. The women involved in building the association had also a secondary involvement given that they were usually married or the daughters of characters who had a strong orange and unionist background. Some of the high profile women we look at were heavily involved at the height of the third home rule crisis and in unionist politics in the city of Belfast since. Annie Bridget was worshipful mistress of the ladies' first lodge number one in San Diego in Belfast and a senior deputy grand mistress of the ladies' grand lodge of Ireland. She was a prominent member of several societies, including the Independent Order of Racketites and the Independent Order of Good Templars, highlighting her belief in total abstinence. She was also a keen unionist figure and supporter of the South Belfast Women's Unionist Association and an enthusiastic fundraiser for Orange Charities. But Evans was a key activity for her and she encouraged it within the Ladies' Association in the early era. Her husband, William Bridget, was also famous within Orange Circles as being a banner painter and a committee member of the Belfast County Grand Lodge. Margaret Brennan was also a member of LOL No. 1, and it's not surprising given that Annie Bridget was her mother. In 1918, Margaret helped establish South Belfast Ladies LOL No. 17 and was its first worshipful mistress, although later, years later, she would transfer to another lodge, 181.
prior to her election as Grand Mistress of the Ladies Association in Ireland, Mrs. Drennan had held district office since 1921 with the creation and expansion of organised Orangism for the Ladies Association in Belfast. Indeed, at the peak of her stewardship of the Ladies Association, the organisation had somewhere in the region of 8,500 members. She died in 1987 at a ripe old age of 101. Following on from that, we look at our last lady today, which was Patricia McLaughlin. She was, in her claim to fame, I suppose, from Northern Ireland context, is that in 1955, she was elected as MP for West of the Fats, the first woman in Northern Ireland to win a contested seat for the Imperial Parliament. She would go on to hold the seat in 1959 general election and was well regarded within parliamentary politics. Again, born in Downpatrick County Down, the daughter of Canon Aldwell, she was educated in Belfast before reading modern languages at Trinity College Dublin. In 1937, she married Henry McLaughlin, civil engineer and director, of course, of the large building firm, the contractors McLaughlin and Harvey. It was above all, however, as a saleswoman, a promoter of Ulster in Northern Ireland and its products, that she was well known, especially in Lennon. And not just locally. For when she was chosen in 1963 to second the address in reply to the Queen's speech, Sir Alec Douglas Home, the then Prime Minister, called her a tireless advocate for the claims of Northern Ireland. And her constituents need never fear that while she is here, they will go on her. Howard Wilson, leader of the opposition at the time, replied that her, she was a woman of great charm. She is, I know, universally liked and respected by all parties in this house. Indeed, she often regarded herself as quite the front bencher when the issue arose. During the payroll tax debates of 1961, she even attempted to speak from the opposition benches, just to emphasise that though she was a conservative and a unionist, she had an independent Ulster streak within her. She was also responsible for the formation of the Westminster Women's Orange Lodge. Now, although I'm from the Iron Order, as they say, I thought it was only appropriate looking at oranges in this context to look at one of the significant characters in terms of the life of Belfast, but also life of Belfast oranges, and that was Thomas Carduff, a shipyard poet. And if anybody wants to know more in detail, there is a very good podcast uh, still online, I believe, by someone called Jason Burke, who interviews a few people in relation to Thomas Kerndoff, so check that out online. Kerndoff was born in Belfast at the height of the First World Rule Crisis, and although born in the staunchly Protestant and Unionist Sandy Row, the young Kerndoff spent much of his early childhood in Dublin. He was educated at the Royal Hibernian School before entering the Royal Military College. He would work in a variety of jobs during his lifetime, an eclectic mix of employment that probably helped shape his outlook in the poetry and prose that he would produce. In 1916, he joined the Young Citizen Volunteers and then enlisted in the Royal Engineers. During the Great War, he would see service at Ypres and the sea. Upon his return to the past, after the war, he again secured employment in Workman Clark and Company, the wee yard, as it was affectionately known, until its closure in 1935. Kern Duff's working class upbringing heavily influenced his political outlook, and he joined the trade union movement of which he was a member his entire life, and became an active member of the independent Orange institution. He was a natural poet, with much of his work providing an insight into the social conditions of his time. This work struck a chord with many in industrial centres like Belfast, but it should not be misunderstood as romanticising the poverty of the working man and woman, but rather as a constant encouragement of betterment and advancement. Moving to a different social class, we take a quick look at Sir Douglas Lloyd Savory. Douglas Savory was born in Suffolk, and England educated St John's College, Oxford, before taking on a number of university teaching roles. 
In 1909, he became professor of French at Queen's University of Belfast and was stay on. During the Great War, he was attached to the Intelligence Division of the Admiralty, a service that probably ensured he would be called upon again by government, and called upon he was. In 1940, he was appointed as the British Special Investigator into the Kiton Massacre of Polish officers, politicians, and intellectuals by Russian forces. This awful massacre was perpetrated by the Russian secret police, the NKPD, to ensure that there would be no future potential intellectual or military opposition to a Soviet-controlled puppet regime in Poland. The massacre sites were actually discovered by the Germans as they advanced through Poland and into Russia, and the resulting outrage almost fractured relations within the Allies, with some consternation and a lot of work having to be done between the United Kingdom and Russia and the exiled Polish national government in London. Savory became Member of Parliament for Queen's University Belfast in 1940 after the passing of Thomas Sinclair and held the seat until it was abolished in 1950. He was then elected as MP for South Antrim. Savory was also a member and one time worshipful master of Eldon, LOL number no. seven, and president of the Huguenot Society of London, being knighted himself in 1952, hence Sir. Our last political figure today is Thomas Henderson MP. Tommy Henderson, or sometimes described as supporters and enemies alike as little or wee Tommy Henderson, may have been small in stature, but he was a political giant from his native Shine Road. Born in 1877, Thomas Gibson Henderson was educated at Jersey Street and Hampton National Schools and initially worked as a painter and decorator, but he had also an eye for painting and fine art. And we in the Museum of Orange Heritage actually hold one of the paintings he produced off the coast road in County Andrew. A member of the Irish Unionist Party, he was one of the founders of the Ulster Unionist Labour Association in 1918 and remained a strong trade unionist throughout his life. In 1920, he offered himself as a parliamentary candidate at a selection meeting, but was met by a very patronising rebuff from the chairman, simply because he was an ordinary working man. Consequently, Henderson left the meeting with and the unionist party. In 1923, he was elected as an independent unionist of Belfast City Council, a seat he retained until his death in 1970. In 1925, and the general election, he topped the poll for Belfast North, and from 1929 was the member for Belfast Shankle. At Stormont, Tommy Henderson stood virtually alone as the sole Protestant voice for some time, opposed to the Unionist government, speaking on behalf of the working classes and often voting with Irish nationalist members while remaining firm in his union's convictions. However, he is best known for his parliamentary stamina. In a debate with Stormont on the 26th of May 1936, he spoke for almost 10 hours on the appropriation bill, starting in the early afternoon and continuing after a short opposition break until 3.55 the following morning. At the time, his speech was the longest made in any British Empire Parliament or legislature. Henderson was High Sheriff of Belfast in 1943 and became a free man of the city in 1964. But he was also a member of LOL 1094, the lodge named after his father, John Henderson, and bearing his image. And it wasn't too bad at making an army drum either. So this now brings us neatly to the last of the figures that I want to leave with you today and spark a little bit of interest as you head back into the library to look them up in more detail. And again, he is a member of the Anglican Communion, Bishop Cyril Elliot. Born Robert Cyril Hamilton Glover Elliot, he would become a well-known figure in orange circles, especially in Belfast. He was brought up in Dublin, the son of Canon Anthony Lewis, Elliot, and from an early age, was heavily involved in church life. He was educated at Aragon School, Bray, and Trent College, Derbyshire, before attending Trinity College in Dublin. 
It was here that the extremely gifted Elliot immersed himself in the classics, a pathway that would serve him well in both education and his chosen career. In 1914, he was ordained as curate and during the Great War would act as a military chaplain to the forces, serving during the Second Battle of the Somme. After the war, he served in Bangor and was elevated to a number of roles before becoming bishop on the 4th of October, 1956. Standing at a full six foot, nine inches tall, he was known in East Belfast as the Big Vicar. He enjoyed great comradeship and par participated with, uh, I suppose he participated with spectators more than those who were taking part in the procession as he walked with his lodge to the annual 12 celebrations at the Field and Fair. Throughout his life, he was also a keen sportsman, interested in golf, more committed to the pathway of rowing, and there was a staunch and lifelong member of the Belfast Boat Club. Bishop Elliot was also a member of the Tannock LOL 1119. So folks, I hope you've enjoyed this little and brief sojourn through some of the individuals that have made not only the civic an important one within the British Isles, but also made oranges what it is in the city of Belfast. They've been significant characters, and I encourage you to take a look a little deeper into their backgrounds and what they achieved. Their impact on Belfast cannot be argued. Their impact on Orangeism continues to leave a positive legacy also. But to be really shameless at the end of this talk, and if you want to learn more about such characters and indeed the wider Orange family in Belfast, why not make your way to the Museum of Orange Heritage on the Prager Road in Belfast? And for those Presbyterians in which I am one, within you, entrance and admission is free. So, thank you.